everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today on another edition of the Gaming Careers Podcast, the resource for people looking to find their fit in the gaming industry. I'm Steve Rudusky, your host, and let's dive in. Before jumping into the actual content of the show today, I want to quickly apologize for the break of two weeks in the previous podcast launch dates. If you're just listening in sequence, you're not going to see this happen, but for those of you that have been listening over the Christmas break, you won't have seen any new episodes come out. A couple of you contacted me to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong with the podcast feed and that we weren't experiencing any technical difficulties. I wasn't in under any sort of technical difficulty. I was on vacation during those two weeks. And I think in the future, this is a good learning lesson for me. I will try to make sure that I point that out before taking the break so that you know what to expect and know when to look for the next uh, podcast episode to come out. All right, and with that announcement taken care of, on with the show. Today, we have an awesome guest with us on the show. We have Phil Reed, award-winning game designer and new CEO of Steve Jackson Games. Phil, thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Thanks for having me on. It's going to be fun. Oh, it's a pleasure. So um, I know that you've been in the industry for quite some time, but for our listeners that may not be familiar with you, can you give us a little bit of your background and, and where you fit in the gaming space? My first professional work in the game industry was with West End Games on their Star Wars role-playing game. I did a little bit of writing for that, and then I ended up doing some self-publishing. I did some graphic design for different companies, and in 99, started doing freelance layout and art for Steve Jackson Games. And by the end of that year, they had brought me on full-time in the uh, production department. Okay, in production department, doing what? I was designing book covers, I was laying out GURPS books, I worked on Cardboard Heroes, I worked on laying out Ogre in 2000, I got uh, promoted to art director, then I was promoted to creative director, I handled some product licensing, the Hellboy role-playing game, for example, was one of the licenses I went out and negotiated and then pushed through on our end. Okay. Um, I just... I did a little everything over about a five-year period, and in the meantime, had started taking a shot at trying out some PDF publishing, and in 2004, I said, oh, this is working far better than I ever expected, so I quit at Steve Jackson Games, went and did full-time PDF publishing for about three years until Steve said, why don't you come back and do this some more, so I went and did that. (laughs) Okay. Now, um... When you came back, you then moved into an operational role and then into the executive role. So coming from art, how 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 does that transition happen? By just being everywhere and persistent and wanting to touch every single part of the business. I think I was in the building probably two and a half months before I started uh, sticking my nose basically into the marketing side. And I think I was at Steve Jackson games. And the funny thing is Steve's very patient person. Because I remember um, mid 2000 or so I'd probably been at the company eight months. We were going somewhere I was driving and he was just starting to ask. So what would you like to be doing? Where do you see yourself five years from now? And questions like that, the the kind of question that you usually stop and you're like, why would somebody ask me this? (laughs) And now I can look back and the clues were there within the first year to two years of me being at the company where Steve and then Ross Jepson, who was even then director of sales, he is now as well, were asking questions that I'm older now, I understand now, they were trying to see, was I a good choice to step into the position I'm in today? Interesting. Okay, so as in your role today as the, the CEO, what do your daily activities look like? I mean, you have a large uh, machine to keep running. Yeah, um, we are still in a state of transition. I've had this position for about a week now, but... My normal day is getting up anywhere between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. And Wait a minute, what? 2 th- in the morning? 
Yes. And then I launch into email, make sure there's no emergencies that need dealt with. Uh, from there, I will either start a little bit of work on whatever game we're working on at the time that I'm involved in or whatever marketing projects going on or on my toy site. I mean, it's all mixed together and by about 4.30, go out for a, about a mile walk, mile and a half, take the dogs, get busy get into the office and start basically at that point, anything can happen because I try to be available to the staff throughout the day. So everything from a warehouse issue to a sales problem to approving a new product can hit my door. And it's not uncommon in an hour for me to see probably 15 to 20 different staff. Wow. Okay. So um, if you're getting up that early to get all of this stuff done, when do you go to bed? I try and be out cold by nine o'clock. Okay. Well, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm worried on your behalf. I want to make sure you get enough beauty sleep. Oh no, I'm fine. Uh, if I can get five to six hours a night, I do great. All right. Um, so being in the game industry for as long as you have, uh, where have you seen the industry go or, or how has it matured uh, since when you started? When I started, uh, role-playing games were actually a significant part of the industry. Okay. And over the last decade, especially over the last five years or so, we've seen that it's both grown and shrunk at the same time. And what I mean is, there are more and more RPGs coming out constantly, mm -hmm. but there are fewer and fewer companies that handle publishing RPGs as their core business. And is that because there's, you know, less potential um, money in RPGs or there's, there's a lot of potential money in RPGs. Unfortunately, let's say 10 years ago, the industry spent a dollar on role playing. Okay. And there were 20 games available. Today, I think the industry is still spending that dollar, but it feels like there's 50 games available. Oh, okay. We're, we're at a point now where in the past you could have a mid sized company with 20 to 30 employees and they could make RPGs profitable enough to support that. It was, a, it was sustainable, but now it feels to me as if you either need a very, very small team or company that is four or five, probably telecommuters that have no central office, or you need to have one of the top games in the industry. Interesting. Okay. That, I mean, uh, for example, look at Evil Hat. Evil Hat does very well with their role-playing games, but they're a small operation, and I don't think they have any central office. Okay. But then we have on the other end, Paizo with Pathfinder. Right. With the last I had talked with uh, Eric Mona over there, they were 60 or 70 employees. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. So is that, um, I guess that ties into my next question, which is what, what opportunities do you see for kind of up and coming game designers and indie publishers uh, in this changing space? So is, is the, a great suggestion to stay small, be reactive to a niche market so that you don't have to take on kind of the, the big dogs in the, in the market for role playing games or for games in general, um, for role playing games specifically, cause that's what, uh, you know, my background and interest is, but I I'd like to kind of expand from there and see how that works for games in general. I, I think if somebody asked me to work on a role playing game these days and I was building something from scratch, I would kind of look to what Fantasy Flight has been attempting with their role-playing games. Okay, what do you mean by that? So I know the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition did not get a lot of support in the market. A lot of existing fans were unhappy with the game. But I think Fantasy Flight may have been too early there. Okay. Because what they did was took all of their experience in board game manufacturing, card game manufacturing, and they created a role playing game. Okay. And that, that market isn't ready for it, but I can see where we're going to hit a point that 
all of us have less time. It's just how it is. We have less time to play games, and it's not just because we're getting older. Even the younger audience has less time to devote to playing a role-playing game. It's tough right, to right. group together. There's so many things out there yelling for our time and money. So designing and building role-playing game that is intended to be played in the same style as a board game. Yep. So you've got like an hour or two hour time period. I think that's going to be the future of role playing games. That's really interesting. And that's, that is a thread that has kind of started to emerge in several interviews that I've had with people involved in role playing games. It's the, the spot that, board games fill is really takes advantage of that shorter time period. And there is a blurring line between the activities that you can do in that two hour, 90 minute time period. So I, I, I think it's very interesting to think that RPGs could go in a similar direction where you could have an adventure that was three hours long, as opposed to, you know, 16 hours long with a, 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 pizza and a box of Funyuns, you know? Yeah, and even if we look at role-playing games, so this is something I've complained about for way over 10 years now. Role-playing games are too big. Okay. Um, if you look at a role-playing game book, that is a giant textbook. So how, when parents go shopping, are they going to look at even the new uh, D&D 5th edition hardcovers, how are they going to look at those and say, oh, I think my 12-year-old son would enjoy this giant book. Right. They don't look like they, they don't look like games. That's an interesting point because they, they, they look like a, a homework assignment. Yeah, they, they do not <laughs> look like games. And that's why I was excited when I saw the 5th edition D&D starter box in Toys R Us. Okay. That's, that's awesome. We need more things like that. But what I think we need also is more things like that that go with it. So go back to the early 80s and the basic D&D box sets. So what is it about box sets that uh, is more appealing than a, you know, a 19 page PDF of the game? Um, For one, a parent cannot walk into Barnes and Noble or Toys R Us and buy a PDF. Okay. Great so point. right now, right now it's Christmas time. We're less than two weeks until Christmas. Parents are out shopping for their kids. It would be awesome if parents could walk into the store and, oh, I'm going to buy this game for my kid, and it's a role playing game. But they don't look, they don't look like games. And yeah. And and like a lot of role playing games in uh, the mass specialty stores like Hastings, B and N. Uh, books a million. They're not shelved with the games because they don't look like games. They don't fit that space. Interesting. So I think with maybe a box set with something that said like a make believe game or something like that, and he had little toys and stuff like that could, could uh, with lightweight rules could really kind of change the skin of role playing games and, and recapture that, that uh, youth market. That, that gives me an idea that I'd love to see somebody tackle we need a Lego role playing game. A Lego role playing game. That is incredible. With All right. Figs, mini figs right in the box. That wow. Okay, so for any of our listeners out there or anybody associated with Lego, give that a thought um cuz I think that that would be hugely successful. I think that would be fantastic, especially after the Lego movie and the whole idea of imagination being important. Well, and that's an interesting point, too. I mean, really, the the function of Legos fills a very similar space to role-playing games. It's the embodiment of of a vision and creative play. That's what Legos are. Right. Well, that's the same thing as role-playing games. You just can can uh, build the Lego uh, sets faster because you're doing it in your imagination. But I think there's some great crossover there. Oh, I think it'd be so much fun. Well, on the point of kind of fast creation and keeping things light, you actually did a really fun, fast role-playing game that you created called Versus Monsters. I'd like to transition into that. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? 
Sure. Uh, Versus Monsters was created in 24 hours. Um, what happened was I was looking at the 24 hour comic challenge. So okay. this is an idea where comic creators say, you know what? I'm going to make a 24 page comic book in 24 hours. Okay. Start to finish done. And this has grown over the years. And at the time I said, Hey, it'd be kind of cool. And I post online and a couple other people did it. And over a day, I created a 20 page role playing game. Right. That right did not take itself seriously at all. <laughs> right. I, for example, um, lists of equipment are boring. Tons of skills are boring. So we're just not going to waste our time with that. Yeah, right. And the entire thing was written a uh, very conversational style. The writing didn't take itself seriously, very tongue in cheek. And I was then surprised by how many people really seemed to enjoy it. And I started getting emails from people who were playing it and said, oh, this is a great little game. Yeah. And um, you also used kind of a, a very simplistic mechanic um, instead of dice, right? You used cards. Yeah, because I I just wanted to. Well, what I really liked about it, um, and, you know, for our listeners, I'll flesh this out a little bit. Um, using playing cards is something that everybody has. They're readily available. Having a simple mechanic to say, yes, you were successful or no, you weren't successful using cards, I thought was a wonderful way to kind of remove some of the role playing game barriers if you're not a role player. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And what's, what's more is I've been role playing all of my life, as long as I can remember. And the more comfortable you get with digesting all of those hundreds of books, I'm looking at a wall of, of original D&D all the way up through 3.5. I have some path, Pathfinder stuff. And you just spend hours and hours and hours with all of these books, and you memorize them. And uh, you get close. And so when you're playing, you don't really rely on r pulling out all of those heavy tomes, you just kind of go on the fly with a lot of it, a lot of it. And I remember growing up that we would have D and D adventures driving in the car to whatever event. And uh, somebody would be telling the story and you'd have a little dice in the cup holder. And it was a very light role playing experience that I think captured the, the fun of role playing without all of the heavy books and going back to this kind of fast creativity for uh versus monsters you really just kind of hit the the fast fun role playing points and get rid of all of the excess rules yeah um and that is versus monsters is definitely not a game for newcomers sure it says that in the intro <laughs> yeah it makes a lot of assumptions that you've kind of been down this road before Right, and I, I guess I just want to point that out for our listeners that the the essence of whatever your game is, and we're talking specifically about role-playing games, um, is a lot about flavor and a lot about kind of resolving a decision. Did you succeed at opening the door? Did you beat the monster? Um, but if you can create that experience, again, and, and pulling from what we've discussed earlier, if you can create that experience in a 90-minute time period, you yeah. might really have something very, very cool. So where I would like to go is talking a little bit about how game designers and creators can get their games out quickly. So can you give us an example from your experience, perhaps at Steve Jackson Games, about some of the timelines, fast timelines that you've been able to get some games out? I, and I enjoy uh, small, quick projects. For example, I just closed a Kickstarter project yesterday for a new book. And when I send the book to the printer in about a week, it will be one one month basically from, hey, I should do this thing until I had a 64-page full-color hardcover off to the printer. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I would imagine that a first-time uh, game designer or a first-time creator wouldn't be able to necessarily be at that pace, right? Um, I don't know. I think it's... Something hardwired into people. Our Mars Attacks dice game is probably a great example at the office of the same sort of thing because it was about two weeks from when I said, hey, we should do this thing, and we were at New York Toy Fair showing it off. Wow. Okay. 
Well, I guess this is adjusting my expectations on the market. So I'm learning right now that, you know, something that fast is possible. It's um, possible. Um, it's a lot easier if you've got a great team. So with the Mars Attacks Dice game, for example, I was out for a walk, said, hey, I wonder how I could adapt zombie dice to Mars Attacks and decided that that wasn't going to work but had an idea for a game that I emailed off to Steve, uh, Ross Jepson, our sales director, and Sam Mitski, who is now uh, chief operating officer. We promoted him as well. Awesome. And outlined what I wanted to do, and rather than wait to hear their opinions on it, I also just went ahead and reached out to Adam Levine, our uh, contact at Tops, and okay. said, hey, I want to make this thing. And this is a Sunday morning. It's probably 6 in the morning or so. By noon that day, I've gotten everybody weighed in with, yeah, you should totally do that thing. That is cool. Yeah, I actually wrote a few blog posts at Board Game Geek about how that went. And the short form is that next Monday, I walked into the office. Sam and I reviewed my notes. I had like a full outline of this is what the game is. Sam took that, played around with it a lot. And within that week, I was playing the finished game, and we were just tweaking, improving, moving forward. The trick at New York Toy Fair is sometimes the products you see, the games, toys, things like that, they're not real. There's enough to them that buyers can look at it and say, oh, this looks like something I would like to carry in our store. Okay. But the the product isn't actually final. It just is a really good, solid prototype. And we had done that with the Mars Attacks Dice game because there were a lot of rough edges, but it was clean enough that we could sit down and run demos and show people this is how the game works. So from there, it went directly into a two-month basically crash course in playtest development and like you were talking about uh, fast iterations. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't uncommon in a single day to go through two or three different versions of different cards as we bashed at it and just tried to knock it out. And that was around everything else we were working on. That wasn't the only project we had during that time. For our listeners out there that want to design a game quickly, what are some kind of, foundational things that they can try to get out on paper quickly so that they can iterate on it. So the first thing you want to do is make decisions about the physical components of the product. Okay. Because that will help constrain you like set a price point, say I am making a $20 game. Okay. So for a $20 game, you know that your manufacturing cost needs to be between two and three dollars. Okay. Lower is always better because any profit you have is going to be eaten up by overhead. Okay. So once you know, okay, let's say I have $2 to make a game. What components can I get into a $2 game? First is going to be the box. Well, we're going to assume the box is 40 to $0.50 because that's a fairly standard price for a box. Okay. And you say, you know what? I'm going to throw some rules in there because I like a rule book. Okay. Just a simple sheet of rules is going to run you about a dime. So now we're up to about 60 cents, and we haven't even got any components to play with. (laughs) All right. So let's say it's going to be a dice game. All I need are tokens to go with my dice game. Well, a token sheet, there's another 20 or 30 cents. So we'll just round it up. We say we've got a dollar now. Okay. So now I've spent half of my budget for this game, and I have a box, rules, and tokens And I don't even have the dice for the dice game. Okay. So we will assume that we're going to use traditional D6. That way we don't have to create a mold because the instant we make a mold, we just spent the rest of our budget and we better hope we can sell tens of thousands of games. Okay. (laughs) Good point. We're just going to say, you know what? We're going to use traditional D6. They're going to run me about eight cents each. I'm going to throw 10 of them in the game. So that's going to be my game. I'm going to have 10 dice. Tokens, rules, and a box. Okay. That's a $20 game right there. And the way to get the price, the retail price lower is for you to accept that you're going to make less money. 
Interesting. Now, what I really find interesting about that suggestion is um, it's kind of, I'll say it's backwards from how a lot of people think about it, but it makes a lot of sense because if you start with what your end components are, that can constrain what your mechanics are. Um, so exactly. you, you have to get creative with within your budget, I guess, is, is the mindset. Right. And if you start with, I have no limitations at all, I can do anything. Unless you've got a lot of experience at this and have some idea of what costs are and how the sales work, you can suddenly find yourself with a game that, oh, I have to sell this game for $100. <laughs> right. And yet and that's, that's, it's not market tested and like, oh yeah, is that going to happen? I, oh, yeah, it's highly that's, unlikely. That's not good. So I personally prefer to start with the, um, product components and target price point. And I learned this idea from Steve because the original Ogre game in 1977, he was telling me, came out of, okay, Steve, here are the components you can have. Make a game. That's really cool. Now, there, there's a music correlation to that. Uh, you know, I, for my listeners, they know that I, I have a background in music. Having 12 notes to, con, you know, which is a scale to compose yeah. within forces you to be creative. Because you don't have more than those notes. Now, there are a lot of scales that have, uh, you know, hundreds of microtones. And when you sit down to try to compose a piece of music, you run into this kind of overwhelming uh, set of choices. I, I can do whatever I want. And so you, you, you can spin your wheels doing stuff that's not productive if you constrain yourself to a very narrow set of, in this case, rules or components. You have to be creative within that get those guidelines. That that sounds fantastic. Yeah, it, it's like it forces creativity. And I know that I, I can share with our listeners a little bit about personal experience with this. I'm designing a card game based off of, uh, you know, some some uh, role playing work that I'm I'm on. And I I look at the, the amount of cards that I can fit per sheet on my printing and my rules are like, well, I don't want to go into this many sheets, so now I have to restrain myself to this many cards. So how do I make the mechanics work in the card game with only this amount of cards? Because while it would be great to have a couple hundred more, I don't want to try to figure out the new box. I don't want to figure out – I don't want to pay for the additional art. Right. Um, so I want to accomplish the goals of the game in a much narrower amount of, of cards, and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, and um, you were talking about – uh, fast development process and we got distracted with component costing. <laughs> yeah. So, and you start, um, you start with, you start with your core components. So this is what the game is. This is what I can use. Okay. Then you want to get your initial thoughts down as fast as possible. You want to make the dirtiest, roughest play test that you can, and you want to play the game immediately. Preferably in the first 24 hours of your idea, you are playing the game with actual people, and you're going to need some friends who you really like and who can put up with you because <laughs> you're going to need to play test this thing a lot. Um, when we run play tests at the office, if it's uh, like it'll be me and Sam and Randy and we'll sit down and we'll say, all right, this is what we're going to do. And we play the game. We get maybe two rounds in and we're like, no, this is what <laughs> we're going to do. And we start over and you're just going as quick as you can because you're trying to find all the bad spots. Yeah. Once you played the game all the way through and you're like, that worked. That wasn't fun then you need to go back and figure out where the fun went. <laughs> just because it mechanically works doesn't make it a fun game. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point, too, because there are problem solvers out there, and I count myself as one of them, that want to figure out a mechanical solution. Yes. That doesn't mean it's fun. Yes. At the uh, office, we run into that at times where... It's easy to find the fix that makes everything work mechanically, but sometimes you want to go backwards a couple steps from where it's, this is perfect mechanically, because earlier it was actually more fun. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so a, a sloppy rule set or a, uh, you know, ambiguity in an area that is more fun is still a better game than one that, that is mechanically perfect. Yes, totally. Um, 
And some games, like Munchkin, when we're working on Munchkin cards, we go back and forth sometimes on writing cards in order to try and create situations where players at the table will each be able to argue a side. Okay. Because it's a lot more fun when you're playing Munchkin to get two or three different people finding bizarre loopholes that yeah. it to be mechanically perfect. So, I mean, th- there's times where we write a card and we're like, that card's great. And then decide, oh, but you know, if we change this one word, somebody else is going to pick up on this later and do something crazy at the table and make everybody laugh. That's cool. Uh, I do want to focus on one other thing that you talked about, which was within 24 hours. And I think that that is really a key to success in just about any industry, which is successfully time boxing a deliverable. Now, that's boring business speak to say, (laughs) when are you going to have it done? Meet your deadlines, people. Yeah. So this, you know, we call these smart goals, S-M-A-R-T. Specific, (laughs) measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Yes, very business boring speak again. But really, having a 24-hour deadline says, all right, get something out that I can look at in 24 hours, and we're going to make it better. And that'll stop you from the never-ending spirals of possibility and grandiose designs and, to your point, component constraints. So if you have a component constraint and a time constraint, I I really think that there's an opportunity to, to knock something out of the park in the iteration process. There is, and a lot of times I've seen with creative efforts, if somebody really has it, if they, it's that um, mythical eureka moment. Yep. Then it's going to happen instantly. And we, I mean, at the office, we run through so many ideas for games and things like that, that if we are not so excited by an idea that we just drop everything we're doing and that afternoon we're playing it. Right. It's right. probably not the best idea we're going to have that week. Interesting. Um, that, that, hipster, hipster dice actually is a great example of that. So I was out for lunch with a buyer. We were discussing games and I was trying to sell zombie dice to a specific, um, chain. Okay. And the answer came back, uh, zombie dice. That's a little too mainstream. Okay. Not really our thing. So I just asked, I said, would a game called hipster dice be more your thing? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And I said, okay. And from lunch, while we're chatting, I email the office, I email a few different people and say, hipster dice, it's four ninety five. it's one die, there's no tokens, there's a rule sheet, have something for me. And by late that afternoon, we had the core game design in place and people were starting to play. That is incredible. Okay, so myself and I'm sure a lot of our listeners, our brains just exploded. So <laughs> you, you, you said, here's here's the constraint, very small, here's your price point, um, something that's kind of broad concept, go do something creative and I need it by this afternoon, and you were able to deliver a concept by then. Yes. How how polished was that concept? Was that something that you could then take to the customer and, and uh, move forward in, in the purchase? No, but within the next month, we had everything clean enough and clean enough and ready for New York Toy Fair to announce it and show it to buyers and get a lot of laughs. Uh, for example, I was at one <laughs> sales meeting, and um, I decided very early on how I was going to treat the entire concept of hipster dice as a product. Okay. So I was in a sales meeting, and I'm showing games. I'm showing. We've got the Mars Attacks Dice game coming up. Here's the newest Munchkin releases we're working on. Oh, and here's this hipster dice thing we kind of did. Okay. I just brush past it as fast as I can. Uh huh. Like, wait, 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 wait. Hipster dice, what is it? I'm like, nah, a little <laughs> obscure. You probably never heard of it. And that plus the sell sheet just did it. 
That's so many people laugh. That's so cool. So like tw- less than 12 hours, um, for initial concept within one month, um, game and, um, still something that draws attention and, and, uh, is compelling. Yeah. And then, uh, about a month after New York Toy Fair was the Gamma Trade Show and I'm doing a big retailer presentation. I'm showing the different games. Um, we announced Munchkin Panic. We announced Munchkin Loot Letter. And I'm running through the slides, and I run up past the one for Hipster Dice, and I'm like, oh, yeah, and this thing. And I just go past it again. <laughs> and one of the retailers, like, basically stands up, and he's like, wait, what? what's Hipster Dice? Yeah. How do you how do you play? And I just look at him and say, really? I thought you were cool. <laughs> nice. And move on with life. Uh-huh. And the funny thing is, now that the game's out there in the world and people are buying it. They're finding there really is a fun, stupid little party game in there. I just, I just personally am playing a much larger game where I'm poking fun at the entire thing and having a good time on the sales side. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, Phil, we are running to the end of our time here. Um, I want to give our listeners a chance to uh, kind of find out a little bit more about you, Steve Jackson Games, and uh, stuff that you might have that you're working on. Can you share a little soundbite with them about that? Okay. Uh, Steve Jackson Games, probably the best place to find us is the website, sjgames.com. And we're fairly active on Twitter, which is at sjgames, because... I use it, Steve uses it, Andrew uses it, Rhea uses it, Brian uses it. I mean, we've got various staff who get in there and answer questions or post things. I personally like to use it to share things that don't exist yet. Okay. So we'll get prototypes of something in or we'll be playtesting something, and I'll try and uh, crop in and just take a little picture and post it. Awesome. Um, Me, I'm on Twitter at Philip J. Reed. And my toy site is battlegrip.com. Excellent. So, and I will make sure that all of those links are in the show notes. Uh, Phil, this has been an incredible hour. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience with us. And uh, I can't wait to do it again sometime. Yeah, sure. And thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure. You've been listening to another edition of the Gaming Careers Podcast. I'm Steve Rodusky, your host, and thanks again for joining me. I was really excited about the content that was presented in this episode. This gave me some real teeth around my own design uh, on my own game project, and it's really already improved my progress as a game designer. So thank you so much, Phil, for your advice. You can find the show notes to this episode at thecompanybard.com slash episode 18. There you can find the links to the resources that we discussed in the show, as well as get access to the extended interview that I had with Phil. And there was some really surprising and excellent content that was available there. Phil went on to describe some of his experience in the toy industry, as well as talked about some of the history of action figure creation. It was awesome stuff. It just didn't make it in this episode due to time constraints. All right, that's it for today. I look forward to seeing you next week. (laughs) 